the Gerontological Society of America, Advancing Innovation in Aging. GSA on Aging. I'm Howard Dagenholtz, Social Media Editor of The Gerontologist, a publication of the Gerontological Society of America. It's seldom that a book review can be summed up in three words, but the recent review of American Dementia by Cameron Camp and Evan Shelton that appeared in The Gerontologist, zooming out on dementia and the effects of American society on brain health can be boiled down to three words, and they put it in the first line of the review, read it now. And you know what? I took them seriously. I read the book and I realized we got to talk to these guys. So I interviewed Daniel George and Dr. Peter Whitehouse about their new book, American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society, just came out from Johns Hopkins University Press. And we had a really great conversation. I learned a lot about their perspective on dementia and the interplay between society and dementia. And I think you will too. So I'm talking to Danny George and Peter Whitehouse about their new book, American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society. Danny, Peter, tell me uh, about yourselves and how you got into this work and this particular project. Sure. And thanks for having us, Howard. Um, So I am originally from Cleveland. I'm a medical anthropologist by training and have worked in uh, dementia care for about 15 years, doing a variety of of sort of arts-based and purposeful interventions in in, in dementia care, all aimed at quality of life. And I, I was kind of brought into this field by volunteering in high school at a daycare facility in Cleveland, where we um, played games with folks living with dementia and listened to the stories that they told. And that really hooked me into the the sort of qualitative effective side of of living with dementia and all of the things that we can do to support uh, quality of life for, for those folks. So you really started with the intergenerational aspect of this. Yeah, absolutely. I was sort of thrown right into that. And then that led to me finding Peter, uh, who, who will Tell, tell you a little bit about himself in a moment, but he and his wife started an intergenerational school in Cleveland. And I ended up doing my doctoral research at this very unique place where uh, people living with dementia who have different dementia diagnoses become mentors in a learning environment with children from inner city Cleveland largely. And uh, so this has sort of been a thread in my work, this intergenerational piece. Yeah. So you're telling us Peter's story. Peter, tell us uh, about your own work and experience and what brought you to this project. Well, thanks, Howard, and thanks for having us. I'm a big fan of the gerontologist, been, been active over the years in the gerontological community as a geriatric neurologist and a cognitive scientist and an environmental ethicist. So that's my academic uh, pedigree. The story with Danny actually starts with my daughters, really intergenerational, right? Because they went to the same high school with Danny in Shaker Heights, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland. And Yes, this intergenerational theme permeates the book and it permeates our lives in ways that we want to bring it forward because I think as we face the huge challenges societies have with individuals with cognitive challenges and the climate crisis and all the other things that we talk about in the book that are the context for this uh, this challenge we have, we believe that intergenerational conversations are so important. And yes, Danny uh, got his PhD. He won the Alzheimer's Disease International Psychosocial Research Prize for research done at Oxford University, demonstrating the value of volunteering in an intergenerational school of people with dementia, including some of my patients. So we really um, started there. So the thesis of your book is to, seems to be that we have, as a society, medicalized Alzheimer's disease and dementia more broadly. And your critique of that is that we've medicalized and commodified the disease in ways that have really foreclosed treating it as a social, environmental, or community phenomena. I'm And I I think that's really fascinating. And I think we we sort of started with the end by talking about intergenerational programs and the school, but I want to understand just a little bit about what you mean by this, um, the way I've put it, sort of commodification of the disease, but also what the consequence of that has been in terms of where we are in terms of uh, treatments and programs and uh, systems. 
as the bad guy here, the medicalization agent, the doctor, the MD, can I just start? Sure. Uh, and I'll start a very recent event, which was the um, unfortunate approval by the Food and Drug Administration of a drug called Adjahelm or Aducanumab. Yeah, you uh, have to update the book. Well, we, we were trying to update the book as we went along, Howard, with COVID and then yes. with Adjahelm. It's in there. Uh, but it was a breaking story. But it, it highlights exactly the point that we t- were trying to make and that you just asked about. There's a concept of regulatory capture. The, the FDA has been captured by the pharmaceutical industry and by the Alzheimer's Association and lay groups who are just desperate for a cure for a condition which is, are, in our opinion, not one thing and not likely to be curable. Hence, this will bridge to Danny's comment about the importance of a public health and social perspective. That drug was pushed through. And we, I, I actually led the initiative to say that the FDA should withdraw it, led the initiatives um, with the Lown Institute and Farmed Out and others to encourage CMS to do what exactly what they did, which is refuse to pay for it ex- outside of trials. So we mm-hmm. put a stop to it, but the regulatory process failed and is being investigated by lots of people because uh, basically industry get, uh, and the opi- uh, co-opted opinion leaders, the, the real medical, the drug lords, as I call them, you just push <laughs> for these simplistic answers to complicated problems. And, and that's why we need people like Danny to address the complicated part. And then to that, I, I would add, um, you know, so in the 70s, we sort of defined Alzheimer's disease as one thing, and that was a political decision. And following from that is this sort of fundamental belief that has organized the last few decades that if we just invest enough money in biotechnology, you know, markets will deliver a cure for this, what Peter has already said is a very heterogeneous age-related syndrome. Uh, that hasn't happened, um, at, you know, even though we've spent billions of dollars in drug development, we have not yielded a drug. I'm, I'm thinking back to an article that we published actually a decade ago in the gerontologist called The Marketplace of Memory. So sort of adjacent to drug development, we also have this billion dollar marketplace of nutraceuticals and digital brain fitness games and all of these other things where people through their individual consumer choices, they're embracing commodified products, as you said, Howard, uh, believing that through r- these rituals of self-care, we can prevent Alzheimer's. That also is is sort of a, a, a path that doesn't lead anywhere. And so, that, you know, as Peter and I have reflected on what's happened these last few decades, billions of dollars spent on fruitless cures and preventative measures. And yet the things that we've experienced at places like the intergenerational school or in engaging in, in arts-based work in, in dementia care facilities, in providing purposeful activities for people living with dementia, those are the things where you really do see the needle move in quality of life and sense of purpose and sense of connection to others. And so, um, you know, we, we really in this book are attacking this marketplace of memory and trying to propose a healthier, more humane way of uh, our culture working with those who are, who are cognitively challenged. We'll get to solutions in, in a couple of minutes, but I want to ask you, is this a distinctly American phenomena? That seems to be a big part of the book and the framing of the problem, but I'm not so sure that we are distinct in that regard. Is Are we exceptional here? So uh, I'm British. I was born in the UK and also have an academic appointment in Canada. So let me start that answer. No, the answer is no. This is a global dementia. The working title of the book was Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society. That's coming becoming apparent. We put the word American dementia in front of it to signify that there is a, and it's not unique to dementia, that's to say this is medicalization of aging in general, as you pointed out, but our thinking about these social problems is in fact itself demented. We have this hubris, this this uh, this foolishness that we think we can come up with quick solutions to, to complicated problems, as we mentioned before. This is not unique to America, but America is leading the world in becoming demented in the sense that our ideas about dementia are being exported to Europe and to, uh, and to China and other places. So to, fair to criticize us for, for, for trying to make it too much an American problem, but it is a character of American accept- exceptionalism that we seem to think that single solutions to, to complicated problems that are just bought with fame and fortune are the way the world works. So I think well, it is a peculiar American challenge. Well, I think we do lead in terms of drug discovery and development, certainly in terms of the amount of money that's invested in those endeavors in the United States really does uh, lead the world and set the pace and set the price for a lot of products. Well, yeah, that's yes, but yes and no. The prices we pay in the States are much greater than elsewhere. Oh, certain, I, certain. I would also say that we lead in direct-to-consumer marketing. We lead <laughs> in giving the industry 
the power to influence the way we think about health. Yes, I celebrate fundamental research, but I don't celebrate the exaggeration of the potential for that to address some of these more intractable problems. You say that the system isn't working, but is it working because we are never going to find a problem or because we're pursuing the wrong solutions? Well, I think so. The, the genesis of this book was really this emergence of research showing decreasing dementia rates in the US, Canada, and four other Western European countries. And the reasons for that have nothing to do with markets, with biotechnology, with any product that's been brought forth in the market, right? It's if, if when you look at it, and this is what we explore in the book, it seems to be due to better prevention and treatment of vascular disease, increased access to higher education, deleading gasoline uh, in the 1970s. These are all interventions, quote unquote, the level of public health and public policy that appear to have ramified over the decades in these decreases in dementia that we're now seeing in the U.S. and these other countries. So those changes were all brought about because of the traumas of the world wars and the Great Depression, right? We had immense suffering in this country, and so investments were made in expanding hospital uh, healthcare systems, in smoking cessation public health campaigns, in the GI Bill and Pell Grants and other things. Those investments all have perpetuated brain health at the population level. So in the 1970s, we had a similar reorganization of the culture around, you know, what we're already, we're sort of dancing around neoliberalism or market fundamentalism, sort of a fundamental restructuring of the economy around free market principles. And what that has done is sort of uh, move the needle in the wrong way on some of the gains that we had in the 20th century. So we now have six in 10 Americans living with chronic diseases. Four in 10 have more than one obesity. We have an obesity epidemic. Exactly. And so we're seeing a reversal of gains in vascular health and the treatment of of vascular problems. Uh, We're seeing a lead crisis, not in our gasoline now, but in our drinking water in places like Flint and elsewhere, which we focus on in the book. We're seeing now a downward trend in college education and because we've marketized a college education. So a lot of the things that appeared to have really benefited brain health over the last few decades, we're now moving in the wrong direction on those things. So there's probably, I'm seeing kind of two strands of solutions. One is this uh, kind of public health orientation that you were just describing, but then the other is kind of where we started in terms of intergenerational programs, a focus on quality of life and generativity in uh, programs and opportunities for people, I I think really throughout the life course, but in particular for older adults, and those have protective effects as you were uh, alluded to and anecdotes in the book really uh, illustrate that uh, very well. But are those two different approaches or are those integrated approaches? So I think, let let me state it as bluntly as I can. We need to transform our society and our civilizations to focus more on things like quality of life and the advantages and positive aspects of aging. So there is a dimension to this, which is a critique of the way we organize modern civilization, which is the critique of market fundamentalism and individualism, which, we, which America highlights. The bridge to that, in my the way I think about it, is public health. We, we have invested far too much in individual medicine and pills for individual people. And if you get from public health, then you get into social determinants of health, economic determinants of health, economic inequity, that are all part of a broader notion of health. It's the public health, but it's also environmental health, Howard. So, uh, if we don't pay so attention to the quality of our environment, dementia rates are going to go up as well. Okay. So are you, so this is what I was trying to get at before. If we do those things, will that reduce the rate of dementia or will it more fully integrate people with memory loss into society in positive ways? Both. So, so you think that there would be fewer people with the syndrome Uh, as you sort of articulated in the book, if we had educational systems, public health systems, drinking water, et cetera, walkable communities, all of the things that kind of go along with that. You can know, maybe I sound a little bit skeptical. I want to hear your strongest argument for, uh, for that mechanism. And wouldn't that help other things as well? I mean, you're sort of powering it on this question around uh, dementia, but I mean, haven't we been saying, people in public health have been saying this about society in general around a whole a whole range of uh, outcomes. 
Yeah, and I think that's well put. So you know, I'll go back to the 70s when we sort of unleashed this wave of privatization and deregulation uh, and globalization and just say that we need to think back to what we did earlier in the 20th century in terms of how the state can be leveraged to benefit the public good. Uh, we've sort of lost that in this era of neoliberalism when we've sort of allocated responsibility to markets and diffused responsibility in, in those ways. But if you think about what it means to have a healthy brain, the, the link between vascular health and brain health is clear. If we had universal health care, we would lower vascular risk factors at the population level clearly. If we had um, universal higher education, as has been talked about uh, recently, or even vocational training, that would build cognitive reserve at the population level. Again, another state investment. If we had you know, a, a major infrastructural plan to replace the water pipes that are leaching lead into drinking water all over the country, that again is a brain health benefit, a heart health benefit, uh, the reduced risk of vascular injury as well. Um, but on the care side, Howard, and I'm glad that you're conflating and, and drawing a distinction between these two things, but you could imagine something like national long-term care insurance as something the state could help provide to ensure everybody as a right of citizenship, uh, long-term care or in-home care instead of this absolutely brutal market-based approach that we have right now. Or we could have arts brought into dementia care in the same way that we did during uh, the Great Depression with uh, some of the New Deal programs that funded artists to create murals and public works. Why couldn't we bring artists into dementia care? The, everything that I've mentioned here is a state investment you know, that we collectively invest in, but that has become anathema and even stigmatized in this era when we value markets and privatization and these sorts of things. And so really what Peter and I are saying in this book is that this is a deep critique and we really need to think about this unhealthy society that we're living in and the demented society that we're in and remember from the past some of the wisdom that made life better for people at writ large in the 20th century. I think this brings together a number of different strands of, of things in, in a very creative way and provocative way also that research on volunteering and work uh, for older adults and people with disabilities and the importance of that, not just to the individuals themselves, but to their communities and people that they interact with. And there's a lot of benefit there, but those things are impossible to fund and support because they don't come from the medical budget. They come from the social service budget, which is flat or declining. So we have everything sort of tilted into all of our eggs are going into one particular basket and very few eggs are going into the other baskets that would go in the directions that you guys are uh, describing. So how do we get there? I mean, I, I think about it, you know, we have a system, this market-based system and I am a, a little skeptical that we're going to overturn it anytime soon. And even a, a, a national health insurance or even a, a long-term care insurance, how does it get us to this place that you guys are kind of describing? Because we're still using the tools that we have, right? Yeah. So to, a comment we often say is Alzheimer's is far more important than Alzheimer's. It's a lever on social change of a dramatic nature that you just characterized. The reason Alzheimer's is a good way in is there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of hopes and expectations that aren't being met. So maybe this is a point where that lever can tip us to improving care for people with dementia or cognitive challenges and the big picture. So where are the other lever points? Well, one is COVID um, and, and now monkeypox and everything else to follow. So that should drive us to thinking public health. And the other is um, income inequity, which is growing in ways that are going to foster political crisis. I mean, third act of which I'm very active in is working on protecting democracy and the climate crisis. And let me end with the climate crisis. We human beings are, are, are very slow at learning these lessons. That's why we need intergenerational conversations about the long-term view about our relationship to our planet and to mother nature, because mother nature is going to be an ally in making these transformations, Howard. And if we don't work with Mother Nature and learn the lessons of how we need to think differently about getting older in our society and taking care of our infrastructure, both built and natural, we're going to, and we're also going to be driven into small communities that are more interdependent. So Mother Nature is going to be the prime dri driving force for this change. I just hope we don't suffer too much on the way to learn her lessons. To pick up the metaphor that you guys develop in the book, I mean, one aspect of our societal dementia is that 
these major problems, they they sort of capture the national conversation and then almost immediately get forgotten and sort of flush down the memory hole. I mean, we're, and, and it's, um, it's ironic you bring up COVID. Just this week, my wife and I were at a conference and we were like, oh, this is great. We're kind of like back to normal, but now she's sick and I'm isolating. So, but at the same time, we seem to have, you know, as a society, we're making great strides to forget and move on. So how much leverage do you think there is from some of these problems? I mean, the global warming problems, we've been hearing about this for a long time, but it's really failed to galvanize action in a, in a broad and sustained way. Such a great point. And you think about the two eras that we talked about in the 20th century, there were crises that drove those changes, right? The Great Depression and the World Wars, and then in the 70s, stagflation and, and the oil crises. And so crises can be the impetus for change. But capitalism is also very good at adapting and stabilizing itself. And when COVID first hit, there was a lot of uh, you know, hopefulness that maybe we could get national health care out of this, or maybe we could make fundamental changes, have job guarantees for people, things like that. None of that really happened. Um, and right. I think you're, you're absolutely right, Howard, that the news today is so fragmented. People have different reality tunnels based on their media consumption that we can't even get any consensus on what the crisis is and what's driving it. Uh, it's sort of dependent on your media consumption. And so I hope that, uh, as Peter's saying, some you know these upcoming crises that we're going to have to deal with can be the impetus for change. But I've got to tell you, like when we were writing this book, I was a big Bernie Sanders supporter. <laughs> And I was very hopeful that there could be, uh, you know, a breakthrough there, sort of an exit ramp from some of this, um, uh, the, the problems, existential problems we're facing. And that didn't come to fruition. So I have resolved, I'm sort of apolitical now, uh, as opposed to when I wrote the book. And I'm focusing more on this idea of lighting your corner, doing what you can do locally in this very difficult era that we're living in. I delivered Meals on Wheels this morning. You know, I have a medical student who's organizing musicians to have music accompany the Meals on Wheels deliveries locally. We're, we're doing programs like Opening Minds Through Art, uh, which is an expressive art program I have my medical students do in, in, in these facilities, uh, assisted living facilities around here. I'm doing gardening work with people living with dementia. I'm just trying to do what I can in my own little small area of influence until there's a broader political movement again, because it's not there right now, unfortunately. So you mentioned assisted living, and, and I want to maybe dig into uh, systems a little bit. So, you know, so there's, um, so I, I'm I wonder what you guys think about memory care in assisted living, memory care as a, a market phenomena for uh, providing options for older adults and people with Alzheimer's disease and other uh, related dementias. Is that the right direction, the wrong direction, a good start that can be improved upon? Uh, how does your analysis uh, interpret that? So my father-in-law just died of COVID in a memory care unit. And I was actively involved in the whole cold special care unit movement, um, yes. where nursing homes recognized that 60% of the people that were living there somehow um, uh, had a cognitive challenge. How do you address this? And I think institutions in general are the wrong way to go. So I think we need to enhance, as you said before, Howard, are we saying that we need to, need to have age-friendly, dementia-friendly, just friendlier communities where people with cognitive challenges, the way we like to put the, the expression, are able to interact in a more integrated way in community? I think that's where health needs to be. It, it should not be built around institutions and built around hospitals. The, the Lown Institute that I'm working with is working on integrating policy for integrating long-term care and hospital care. But you see the domination of the medical model also through the dominations of hospitals who do not deserve, in many cases, their nonprofit status. So integrated healthcare, better institutions, quote unquote, when people are at the end of life care, hugely important for everybody. That ought to be emphasized, but the action ought to be in making healthier communities in my perspective, in my view. Danny, what are you, uh, what are you working on now? What's your next big thing? Sure. So other than the local work that I've mentioned before, which is sort of arts-based and assisted living environments and in the community, I have partnered with the research team at the Johns Hopkins Center for Psychedelics and Consciousness Research. And they're yeah. building on their initial work using psilocybin, which is a compound in magic mushrooms, to treat 
many different psychiatric conditions, PTSD, eating disorders, depression, death-related anxiety, things of that nature. And they're now implementing a study for people with mild cognitive impairment. There's some indication that psilocybin may elicit elicit, um, neuroplasticity, that it may have an anti-inflammatory effect in the brain, but also that it may create these therapeutic windows for people who have kind of ego related struggles that perpetuate um, mental mental health problems in their lives. And so they're um, uh, doing these psilocybin interventions for people with MCI and their caregivers. And I think that's a very interesting exploratory study. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done to establish any even initial efficacy. But I'm glad that, that researchers are thinking outside the amyloid box, thinking about different approaches to support quality of life and purpose. Uh, so that's that's sort of the main area that I'm working in right now. Thanks, Peter. So I actually worked on psychedelic therapies when I was at Hopkins um, as a medical student. So part of my past, but I'm trying to figure out how to get arrested strategically. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, I work with Third Act with Bill McGibbon. I've worked with the Lowen Institute. I'm learning um, how to organize act actions because, you know, for me at 73, and I forget how old Danny is, but he's a, a couple of generations distant. It's legacy. It's what do I want for my grandkids? And it's how can I use the networks I have as an older person to, to speak truth to power? And, um, you know, frankly, as we were talking about earlier, uh, Howard, things are looking not looking so good unless we ramp up our game. And that's why I, I would urge all, all your gerontologists out there to think about the third act, an organization or elders for climate action, an organization for older folks to, to make a difference. And also personally disinvest from banks that are uh, supporting the fossil fuel industry. We are still putting too much carbon in the atmosphere. That is the key change that we have to make. We have to move towards get rid of fossil fuels. So forgive that plug, Howard, but that's exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to activate people. Well, thank you very much. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time. It's a great book. And I'm glad that the gerontologist chose to do an editorial. And you guys have been great to talk to. Thank you. Thank you for having us, Howard. We appreciate it. Thanks, Howard. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the gerontologist and to read its latest articles, visit the website at www.geron.org. The Gerontological Society of America was founded in 1945 to promote the scientific study of aging, to encourage exchanges among researchers and practitioners from the various disciplines related to gerontology, and to foster the use of gerontological research in forming public policy.